Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to Rich Reviews. And today we're going to cover off how to prepare a supercar for a highway rally. Now by highway rally I mean an organised rally that's being performed on the road. So like the Milamigle, um, the Gumball Rally or the Modball Rally, which is what we're taking part in next week, which is predominantly what we're preparing our car for now. So usual caveat guys, I'm not a qualified mechanic, although I do have mechanical engineering background. So the items I'm going to cover off, I'm going to use my 458 as a reference point, obviously because that's a supercar I own, uh, but these items will be useful for you for making sure that your supercar is in general roadworthy. Um, when I say roadworthy, I don't mean mechanically sound and, and, and suspension sound, etc. I mean from the point of view of liquids, uh, tire pressures, tires in general, overall health, and um, items like the battery etc. So just general roadworthy items to make sure the car isn't going to break down. So the first item we're going to check is the oil. Now no I'm not going to go to the toilet first of all although if your oil level's low you might need the toilet. <laughs> I'm going to use this to wipe the dipstick. Now the first thing you need to do is get the car up to operating temperature. Now the temperature that's quoted in the manual is 90 degrees. Now you check this as you can see here by looking at your oil temperature gauge on the car's cluster, on the car's dashboard cluster to make sure that you're around that temperature. Now here we're around 80 degrees. Now today it's quite an overcast day, we couldn't actually get the car up to around 90 degrees, not unless we've driven it for ages. So around 80 to 90 degrees is fine but it says 90 degrees in the manual but we're going to cover it off for 80 degrees today. The reason why they, why they say that it needs to be warm, it needs to be that temperature, is because you're using an overflow tank. It's got what's called a dry sump, the 458, so the actual oil is held in an over, overflow reservoir, in a reservoir where the, the scavenger pumps pump the oil to, and you check the oil in that reservoir tank, which is where we're going to be checking the oil. Now, the oil reservoir tank is just situated between the plenums of the engine. So these are the plenum chambers, airbox, plenum chambers, and this is the oil reservoir, and this is your oil filler cap. Now you have to check the oil when it's hot, because that's, that's how you check the oil when you've got a dry sump system. And you don't have to worry about getting burnt or anything, although the cap will be quite warm. So first of all, you loosen off the cap. And this is why I've got the, the cloths. You take your cloth, and you need a light background cloth. You'll see why in, in a minute. Now first of all you take the cap out, make sure you're not dropping and you make sure be careful of the dipstick. This is the dipstick and you wipe the bottom of the dipstick. So you remove any resi residue from the dipstick to make sure that it doesn't, show it doesn't falsify the markings. Now first of all on the dipstick, your minimum placement point for the oil is that first hole and your maximum placement for point for the oil is that top upper hole. Now your oil level should be between the two with the car around 80 to 90 degrees. The oil temperature with, with, the, with the oil temperature around 80 to 90 degrees, your oil level should be, between, should be between those two markers. Do not, whatever you do, fill it above that marker, otherwise you could blow the seals and cause yourself a major, major headache. It's a big problem for these cars 
if they're overfilled with oil. I would always make sure that the oil is between those two markers and not near the top, just to make absolutely sure that there's still expansion point for the oil. So how you actually check it, you wipe your dipstick, you've got the car up to operating temperature, the car is on a level surface. Now you need, that's important, you need the car on a level surface. Now you put your, you put your dipstick back in the oil reservoir and where these slots are here, you make sure that these pressure prongs, or they're called spring, locate within here so that the cap is at its lowest point, but not tight. So just let it rest in, so you'll, you'll feel it, because that's, that's above it, that's down. That's where you want to measure the oil from. Literally, you just put the cap back in, slot the dipstick in like that, wait a few seconds, you pull it out, and then you measure it. And as you can see there, my oil level is perfect. So the first marker is there, the second marker is there, and I'm a little bit above medium. So that is perfect for the oil. That is a perfect reading for the oil. You shouldn't really burn much oil with these. I haven't had to top my car up at all. I've never had to top the car up at all for the oil. They say that they can burn a certain amount, over, over 600 miles. They say it can burn between, I think, 1.1 litres and two litres of oil. I think they're covering themselves there. In general, these cars shouldn't burn too much oil. Mine certainly doesn't. And to put it back, you just put it back in again. Make sure that those markers, make sure that those springs line up with your slots and make sure that you're going to get your Ferrari logo because these things are important. That Ferrari is pointing towards you when you look at the car, when you look at the car's engine. Make sure you pop that back in. Just let it slop around until it locates around the point and then twist it back and you'll see that Ferrari logo then shows towards you. I've just dropped a little bit of the oil there, but because I'm using some toilet paper, I can just wipe it up. So toilet paper is brilliant for this. Not only does it provide you with a cloth to wiping up any oil you might have dropped or dripped from the dipstick, but also it's a very contrasting background. It's a very contrasting light background. So you can put your dipstick against it and it shows up clearly where the readings are. And that's very important. And it's very important as well that you hold the dipstick horizontally. I know I'm probably t teaching my grandmother how to suck eggs here because it's bloody obvious you keep it horizontal. What you know, if you hold it up, you, obviously the oil's going to drop down from the dipstick marking. But just to make sure you guys realise, keep it horizontal so the oil retains on the dipstick markers, and you can read then the dipstick level for the oil. Very important. And oil is vital in these cars. You know, even though they say that you don't really need to check the oil as long as you get the car serviced by a dealership, they say you don't really need to check it in between the servicing. I may know. If the, car, if the car goes out of oil, the engine's buggered and you're into a massive bill. So I check the oil around every couple of months, something like that, not too often. As long as you know the car isn't burning much oil, then you know if it drops in oil, there's a problem. So if you check it fairly regularly yourself, then you'll know if there's a problem, if suddenly the oil level's a bit lower. They also say as well, once you've set the car on a level, then you should wait a few minutes before you actually check the level. But I found that you're going to have waited a couple of minutes before you lift the top up anyway and check the oil, so you'll be fine. So that's checking the most vital fluid of the car, the engine oil. So now we're going to cover off, guys, the second most vital fluid in the car, and that is the water, which provides cooling for the engine. Oil also acts as a coolant for the engine. A lot of people think it's just water when you've got a water-cooled engine. Well, in fact, no, the oil actually acts as a coolant as well, but also, water is predominant coolant for these engines as well. Now, the water coolant reservoir is held here, to the right-hand side, front, front right-hand side of the engine cover. This is the overflow pipe, so if the water level is too high, that's the overflow pipe. Now, I've got the engine running at the moment because I've just checked the oil. One thing you must do when you're checking the water is engine off and the engine must be cool. So let's switch the engine off. Also, it makes it a lot easier for you guys to hear me as well. And that was with the valves closed, so the valves weren't open. So let's just assume that the car is cold. I've, I've, I've got mechanic engineering background. I used to build, rebuild engines, etc. So I know what I'm talking about and I know what I'm doing. So you should never check a water level when the car's hot because opening up the cap, the water could expand quickly, fly out, because you're releasing the pressure. It's a pressured system, so you're releasing the pressure, and it could fly out on your face or burn you and scold you. So never check the, oil, never, so never check the water level when the car is hot. Now, I'm, I'm going to check it now. I know that the car has cooled down enough. 
and I'm just going to release the pressure. I know what I'm doing here. And what you're looking for now, if you just pop round here, the lowest water level marking is where the flange of the reservoir is. So that plastic flange down here, or the rim, or whatever you want to call it, but that plastic flange is where the low level marker is for the water level. So if we just, I've loosened this off now, so I know it's going to be okay. If you just take it off, be careful of this overflow pipe, make sure you don't damage the overflow pipe. If we just lift that off and we turn it to one side so it's not going to drop any fluid down. You can see inside there that my water level is just above that flange. And the reason it's a multi, it's the reason why it's coloured red like that is because it's got antifreeze mixed in with the water. And the antifreeze you have to have mixed in to prevent the water from freezing during the winter periods, but also as a massive, massive priority you use antifreeze because it has anti-corrosive capabilities as well because these engines are various different metals in effect aluminium and so you have to make sure that the aluminium doesn't corrode and putting a, a correct additive which is the antifreeze in with the water make sure that it doesn't corrode so I'm just going to put this cap back on again now again when you're putting the cap back on make sure you keep hold of it's a bit tricky or can be a bit tricky make sure that you're not forcing the overflow pipe in case you break it. So just keep that to one side at this, at this point here, at the, at the strongest point of the overflow pipe connector, and then make sure it's tight, but not overly tight. And then that's it, that's the water level covered off. So we can see there my water level is fine, um, but that's also a very important item to cover off. Now, just to cover off again, or just to talk a little bit about the overflow pipe, this overflow pipe comes down and drops down here near the offside rear lower wheel arch or near the sill end cap. That is the overflow for the water coolant. So if you see water dripping out of there, usually it's no cause for concern. It's just where the water's expanded and it's coming out of the water overflow. But you, you don't want water coming out of there all the time. So just watch it. If you're seeing some water come out, just keep an eye on it. So we've covered off the oil and we've covered off the water. Now, what we're gonna cover off is the power steering oil. Now I've got my trusty toilet paper in hand, guys, so I haven't, I'm not going to the toilet. Again, this is, this is just to, to act as a background and as a wiper. So now we're gonna cover off the power steering fluid. Now the power steering fluid is an oil, but a special type of oil. Don't, don't start putting engine oil in your power steering reservoir, whatever you do. Now the power steering reservoir is held in line with the oil reservoir. So this is your oil reservoir as I've detailed earlier. This is the power steering fluid reservoir. Now the power steering fluid is, is a hydraulic fluid, but a special type of hydraulic fluid. I believe it's very similar to transmission fluids, so automatic trans transmission fluid. Power steering fluid is used in the automated power steering rack in the, in the power steering rack. So in effect, it assists or acts as the assistant to as a hydraulic fluid under pressure to be able to assist the rack to move left and right. How, we, how do we check that? Okay, first of all, make sure the car is warm, the engine or the, the, the whole car is warm and the engine is warm. Obviously, it's the engine area that you want warm, but warm up the car first of all. There isn't a specific temperature, but just make sure the car is warm. So we know my car is warm because we've already checked the oil and the oil had to be around 80 to 90 degrees or 90 degrees preferably to be able to check the oil. So we know the car's warm. Don't necessarily need the, the engine running to be able to check the power steering fluid. So, so the, the power steering cap is here where the actual engine cover locates or just in front of where the engine cover locates and between where the engine cover locates and the engine um, oil reservoir. So this cap can be quite tight and again you've got an overflow reservoir on the cap. You don't want to break this pipe, it may be brittle if the car's quite old and you don't want to break this plastic connector on top of the cap. You know good old Ferrari tax would come into play. So keep your finger locating this pipe and this pipe section where it connects to the overflow pipe. Loosen it off, make sure that's rotating properly. And again, you'll note, just gonna get some toilet paper ready because we don't wanna spill it all over the car if we can avoid it. Now, straight away, you'll note that there's a dipstick in there again. Now, what I'm gonna do as well is just ease this pipe out of that latch point there and just lift it up and you can see there. Now, we've got the lower minimum marker. Again, hold the dipstick horizontal. It's yellow, the dipstick. So a nice contrasting background is with this white toilet paper. 
So you've got your lowest marker there and you've got your upper marker there. Now mine's actually showing just above the lower marker. Now my car will be going in for a service after the mod ball rally and the guys will be checking the power steering fluid. So I don't need to put any more power steering fluid in there. It's above the lower marker and it's fine. And the car isn't as hot as it could be. So that oil would expand a bit more with the car being hotter. And that's the reason why you must check these oils when the car is hot, hot when the engine is hot. Um, because these types of fluid expand and you want to measure them when they're expanded to their most level um, so you check accurately. Otherwise you're going to overflow blow seals, etc, etc. You do not want to be in that situation. Um, you won't get into that situ situation so much with power steering fluid. It's not as critical as oil, engine oil, but it is still critical. So you should never overflow these fluid areas. And I'm just putting the cap back on again. I'm putting the cap back on and making sure that I'm I'm being very gentle with the, with the overflow pipe, making sure that I keep the overflow pipe and then making sure the overflow pipe can move properly and it's not going to break and just nip it up so it's fairly tight but not overly tight and then make sure that your overflow pipe is located into this little notch in the engine cover bracket. As you can see it locates down there and the engine fluid overflow pipe will drop down underneath the engine so you're You'll know if you've got any power steering, sorry, that is not the engine oil overflow pipe, that's the power steering overflow pipe. Um, you'll know if you've got any overflow from the power steering because it will be a red, reddish color. So if you get any reddish stains on your engine, on your garage floor or on the floor where you park the car, that would be an overflow from the power steering reservoir. Power fluid, power steering fluid reservoir. Get my words mixed up there. Now, we're, we're done with our toilet paper, I'm afraid, guys, so I could put that to one side. But it's always useful to have it, you know, if you ever get caught out, you can go and, you know, pop around the bushes. <laughs> we don't do that, all right? We don't do that, guys. So we can close down the engine cover now because we've now covered off the key vital coolants um, and the key vital fluids for the car. Now, that the key fluids are the engine oil and the engine cooling water, but power steering fluid is also important as well. Now, what we're going to cover off now is we're going to cover off ancillary items, um, well, actually, first of all, what we're going to cover off is the brake fluid. So we're going to cover off the brake fluid to make sure that there's enough brake fluid. Now, this is a vital fluid as well, but not specifically in relation to the engine, but obviously in relation to the brakes, but very, very vital. If you've got problems with your brake fluid level, then you're in major issue. You've got major issues coming up. So let's open up the front. And I'll show you how to cover this off now. For those who haven't seen my previous videos, I also covered off um, checking your brake fluid level in one of my previous videos with regards to the brake recall. So these cars have recently had a brake recall where the engine cap had to be replaced um, because there was leaking fluid between the master reservoir, the brake master reservoir, and the power assist pump system, or power assist system. Um, so I covered that off in, in a couple of videos. So check my videos below to, to, to check to see additional information with regards to the brake recall and how to do this and more specifics with regards to caps etc. We're just going to cover off the actual brake fluid reservoir. Now when you're removing this, this cap here to gain access to where your brake fluid cap is and where your brake fluid reservoir is or access point, be very careful because this can be brittle. So you want to squeeze it in on this left hand side and then just lift it up and you'll see these hooks. These hooks locate in this part. So you press it in very gently, you don't push it in hard because this can be brittle because when items get hot, when plastics get hot, over time they do become brittle. Now this isn't necessarily brittle, it isn't that whole, this is a 2015 car, but some of your cars may be 2010 cars and they, won't sl they will have a slightly different design to this as well. Your cap will be smaller and you may have some other um, caps there because the 2015 or the later cars are a bit different. Now first of all, just to give an appreciation of what we have here, this is the air conditioning refill pipes, so ignore those. This is what we're trying to deal with here. Now, this is the brake fluid cap. Now, I dealt with the brake fluid being um, brake fluid overflow issue post the actual recall. As you can see, mine has a bit of that now, so it has expanded out, out through the cap. There's a little slit in this cap now, as you can see there. That slit in the cap, that, that slit in the cap now allows any fluid that's um, any fluid that needs to expand out to actually be released out through the cap now and any pressure to be released out so that you don't get the breaking and of the seal, so you don't get fluid pushing out and forcing out and between the seals of the brake master cylinder and the power assist system, which is important. But sometimes you'll get this situation where you have to 
you have this reservoir here section. Again, I deal with this in my other videos, but this is, this is by design. This reservoir section, this, this um, lip, this plastic lip is by design. It enables that if the brake fluid does overflow, it's retained in this section and then you can mop it up. Now I'll just show you how I mop that up, guys. Guess what I use? <laughs> no points for guessing. Toilet paper. Now I've got some here that I've already, already set aside. Literally, you just fold up some toilet paper. It's, it ain't rocket science. And what you do is you get this so this is nice and thin that it will fit between the thread of the reservoir and the lip. So, but put it more towards this end because you want to soak up the fluid. You don't want to tip the fluid over because this fluid is corrosive. Brake fluid is corrosive. You can see there, it's lapped some up. And then we just go back into here again, deeper this time into the reservoir. Just push it around this section. As you can see, it's nicely soaked up that excessive brake fluid. Okay, then wipe the, the thread. Make sure you don't get any of this toilet paper in the actual reservoir itself. Now, if you look down in this reservoir, I'll come over the other side, guys, so you can get a better shot. Now, if you look down inside this reservoir, you'll see this like um, platform bit to the left-hand side, to this side, you'll see this platform bit down there, which is beneath the fluid. That is your low fluid marker. That is your low fluid level. If the fluid goes to that level or below, or anywhere near that level, you need to be filling it up. You need to be topping it back up again. So that, again, to, to reiterate, that platform section on the left-hand side, that is your low level marker, okay? Just by the construct of the design of it, that, but that is your low level marker. Now your upper level marker is just beneath the top of the cap. So just beneath the top of the nozzle or, or whatever you want to call this, but there. So the fluid should be about touching the bottom of the plastic section there. Mine's a little bit lower because I took some fluid out because it overflowed before. It was slightly overfilled when my car had the brake recall because they obviously check your brake fluid levels and they make sure your brake fluid levels topped up. And this is the new design cap as well, if you, in case you haven't seen it. So just gonna pop that back on again now. Again, make sure it's fairly tight, but don't murder tight. Don't do it murder tight, because that's how you strip threads and cause all sorts of problems. So just nip it up gently. You don't need to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to tighten these things up, just nip it up gently. And when you're putting your cap back on, again, make sure you get your locators in right. So this bit, this bit locates in this side. You can see there's a slot there. So locate that in that side like so, okay? And this side, you just pressure it in slightly on these, locate that, that larger locating point back in again, and then you press these in, and then it slots back in again. And just wiggle it around just to make sure it's located properly, and that is located properly, and that's not gonna come out. So that's all your major fluids now. We've covered off the engine fluid level. We've covered off the engine water cooling level. We've covered off the power steering fluid level. We've covered off the brake fluid level. And now, as an ancillary item, far from vital, we're gonna cover off the washers, the screen washers. Now, screen washers is just a little, I haven't actually opened this up at all since I've had the car. So this prob probably is gonna be a bit, a bit tricky to open. Oh, there you go. So that is your washer fluid level. Now it's low, so I actually need to top mine up. Now that water level, that, that reservoir, that water reservoir, that covers you off for your screen washers and your headlamp washers. That's what these are, these are headlamp washers. So you, that, will, that reservoir supplies both the screen washers and the headlamp washers. So that now needs to be topped up. Now the fluid you top that up with, again, has a mixture, it has uh, an additive in, that you put in with the water and that acts as, a, acts as a detergent to help you clean the screen and clean your, your headlights. But also it's an anti-freezing agent, it has an anti-freezing agent in it. So it doesn't freeze when you're driving the car during the winter periods or when the car's even in your garage in the winter periods. You still need these anti-freezing, you still need these additives to the, 
to the to the water to both the engine cooling water and to the screen wash water whether the car's been driven or not guys because it stops the water from freezing and obviously it's got additives in there to help with the general running of the car whether it be for the engine anti-corrosive elements for the engine or whether it be detergents to help you clean the screen now i've got a feeling that this center item in here actually pulls up to enable you to top it up now i say that because like i say this is really honestly guys this is the first time i've opened this but i just know how these work yep i'm right so you lift that up you pull it up it's got a filter at the bottom and what you do is you pull that up and that enables you to have um it, in effect that allows allows air to get into the system while you're topping it up or air to release from your reservoir rather so that it allows the fluid to go in a lot easier so you lift that little reservoir up there and then you put the water in, you pour the water in through there until it comes up to the top. And then you just pop that back down again. You, you Sometimes you have to twist it like that, twist it to put it back down again. And then you push the cap over and that's it. You've done the water reservoir for the screen washers and for the headlamp. So that's pretty much all your fluids now. We've covered off guys. So now we're gonna move on some ancillary component checks that you need to perform. Predominantly leading into tires, battery, and bits around the suspension. But let's talk about the tires first of all. So whichever tire you're checking out of the four, obviously you need to check all four, make sure that you can see the tire tread properly when you're checking the tread depth. And we're also gonna go through the tire pressures as well in a minute. First of all, with regards to my car, the easiest way to do that, when I'm, I'm gonna show you by example, the front offside, which is the front right-hand side of the car. I, I'm gonna start the car up, I'm gonna turn the steering to the right so it opens up and shows the tire clearly so I can show you on video and so it's quite evident, it's the easiest way to check it. And then obviously when you're checking the left-hand one, you might be able to see the rear of the tire on the left or if not, then turn the steering wheel to the left. Now be careful when you're turning the steering wheel, don't ram it, you just wanna do it gently so that it exposes the tire. And then we can turn the engine off. Excuse me while I get out my ancient knees and hips. So, first of all, let's look at the tried Ted. So, <laughs> tried Ted. So, so let's have a look at the at the tire tread. Now, I've got I've got uh, Pirelli P0s on here. These tires were put on um, from new for the car, so these tires have never been changed. I am going to change these tyres, but I'm going to change these tyres after the Mod Ball Rally. I'm going to put, I'm going to do a colour change, a slight colour change on the wheels. And while doing the colour change, I'm going to put Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's on, which are a great tyre for these cars. They're an all round good tyre that cover, cover you off for both the wet and the dry, but predominantly for when you're driving a little bit in the rain, but mostly in the dry. So Michelin Pilot Sport 4S is about the best tyres you can get for this car. There's a bit of a problem getting the 4S's for the front with the Ferrari branding, but in general, Michelin Pilot 4S's in the right sizes will be good for you. Now, looking at the tire tread, the legal tread depth is 1.6 millimeters. So ignoring, try Ted Mark, tread, ignoring, bloody, I've got this Ted bloody thing in my friggin' head now. Ignoring tire tread markers, it has to be, you have to have 1.6 millimeters of tire tread left on the tires you can see here i easily have on these tires no problem at all now that is across 75 percent of the width of the tire and across the whole circumference so that's 1.6 millimeters of tread across at least 75 percent of the width of the tire for the whole circumference of the tire now let's get back to the tire tread markers because that's the easiest way to check the tread so if we come in here you can see the tire tire tread marker is here so this is a tire tread marker that's an example of tire tread marker. And as long as that is below your tire, your, as, <laughs> as long as that is below your tire tread depth, then you're fine. As you can see, that's well below for me. So these have loads of meat left on them, but I'll, re I'll be replacing them anyway. And predominantly I'm replacing them because they're, they're um, Pirelli P0s. They're nowhere near as good, my opinion, and loads of other people's opinions. Nowhere near as good as the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. And because these were supplied with the car, these tires are getting a bit old now. There's no, there's no issue with these tires with regards to cracking. They're not showing any signs of aging, otherwise I would have changed them before. Uh, but they're just not gonna be as good as my Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's and they will have some deterioration in them because at the end of the day, these were supplied with the car in 2015 and they'll be a little bit older than that because of course they're not gonna have been made 
at the instant this car was made. So be wary of that. We're just going to see if the tyre is actually exposed with you just turning the steering wheel to one side, as, a, as you can see it is. So you can check this tyre as well. And it's very easy to actually check and run down to see where the tread marker is. The tread marker's there. Unfortunately, it's a bit in the wheel arch, but again, well, we've got loads of tread left on these tyres, so no issues whatsoever. So 1.6 millimetres across at least 75% of the width of the tyre across the whole circumference. Right, now, with regards to tyre pressures, I can only talk with respect to my Pirelli P0 tyres, which are supplied standard with this car. Now, the tyre pressures on my car for the Pirelli P0s, so this is a, a 458 Spider. remember this is different for your different supercars, is 2.1 PS on the front, which is 30 PSI, and 2.0 PS on the back, which is 29 PSI. So 30 PSI, 29 PSI, 2.1 PS, 2.0, 2.0 PS, okay? So those are, the, those are the pressures on the car. Now, you've got your TPMS management system on these cars. Now the TPMS transmitters are actually behind the valve inside the tire. They have batteries. They transmit information to a, to a receiver just behind this wheel arch part, which is connected to the ECU. And that information is then transmitted to your screen, to your TPMS management screen. It's good to look at those screens and to keep, to keep an eye on it when you're driving the car, but with regards to managing the tire pressures beforehand, you want to check the tire pressures when, they are, when the car is cold, so not hot, because the air will expand when the car's hot and you get a false reading. So the car needs to be cold, the tires need to be cold predominantly, and check the tire pressures when, when, the, when, the, when the car is cold, when the tires are cold, and you check with an accurate gauge. Now, I would recommend an electronic gauge, but there's the old style pressure gauges as well if you want, but an electronic gauge is gonna be a lot more accurate. So get yourself a really good electronic gauge and check your tire pressures properly. Make sure that you're using the correct tire pressures. Now, if you wanna see where the tire pressures are located, they're detailed in your user manual, of course, but also driver's door here. It's also located here on this label, and you'll see there the pressures that I was talking about. 2.1 for the front, 2.0 for the back. And that is vital as well. I would recommend, especially if you're doing something like a gumball rally, mod ball rally, or any type of rally, that you check the tire pressures every day. It's vitally important. With regards to general use, check your tire pressures at least once every week, guys. Now I know, predominantly, none of you are checking your tire pressures. I just know that. Um, <laughs> because people generally don't. Don't rely on your TPMS system. By the time you're looking at your screen, you will have driven the car for a certain distance and the tires will already be warm. So you'll get a false reading. You need to check these tire pressures when the engine is cold, guys, okay? Check them once a week, at least. It's important, all right? You can have a bloody accident. And remember, if your tire pressures are below or above a certain percentage difference of the legal requirement or the requirement for your car, it voids your insurance. That should motivate you enough, guys. I'm always checking my tire pressures, always. Pretty much every single time I use a car, I check the tire pressures. So get it into your head, guys. You need to check the tire pressures. You need to keep on top of that. And you need to check it with a good electronic gauge. It's bloody vital, all right? It's vital. I can't ram that down your throats enough, all right? Now, we're just gonna cover off some ancillary items now. We're, we're doing a mod ball rally next week. You wanna make sure your battery's in good condition. If your battery's not in good condition, your car's not gonna be on the battery conditioner while you're doing these rally events. So say for example, you know, we're doing this rally event, we're gonna have, I believe it's four nights when the car isn't on the battery conditioner. So the battery has to be of good quality, otherwise during those four nights, when it's not on the battery condition, when the electronics are uh, taking juice from the battery overnight, when the, car's, when the engine isn't started, when the alternator isn't putting charge back into the battery, if the battery's not strong and good, then it's gonna bugger up the battery and you're not gonna be able to start the car the next day and you look a complete prat when all the other cars are ready to go and you ain't gonna be ready to go. So make sure you, your battery's um, good, in good condition. If it isn't, then swap it out before you do any of these rally events. Very, very important. Uh, make sure also, even if your battery is in good condition, as you're, I mean, you should always keep your car in the battery condition anyway, especially these 458s. 
but make sure you've got your car on the battery conditioner for at least a day, preferably two days and nights before you take part in any of these events. So it's fully topped up right to the top level and it's as good as it can be ready for, for your mod ball rally or for whatever rally you're performing so that it can take not being on charge overnight for a few nights or however length, however long your, your event is. Um, also preferably take your battery conditioner with you so that if you can, you can plug it in and you can get a little boost up if you need to. And if your battery does go flat, you never know, it might help you recover the car. Now, it ain't rocket science. If your suspension is knocking, if your ball joints are knocking, if there's any problem with your steering, etc., make sure you're getting those problems resolved before you do anything like a road rally, because obviously your car's unsafe. And if you're concerned with your car in any way, shape or form, take it to the dealership, get it checked out by your dealership before you do any event. In fact, that would be a recommendation to take, take your car to a dealership if you're doing a major event to make sure it's checked out or serviced before you do a major event. These are ancillary components um, that you can check or ancillary items that you can check that I would check, that I have checked um, to prepare my, my car, make sure my car is ready and prepared for the Mod Ball Rally and my car will be serviced literally the day after it comes back from the Mod Ball Rally. So guys, I hope that's been very useful for you. I know a lot of people have been asking me in my comments um, with regards to oil level checks, etc. Um, so I know that a lot of you guys are interested in this information and whether or not you're preparing your car for a rally for, or for a, a, an event of this type. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. If you find the video useful, please give it a thumbs up. It's very important to us, guys. Give it a like. And if you're not subscribed, please think about subscribing. Again, vitally important for us to move the channel forward. Thanks, for, thanks a lot for watching, guys. Don't forget, we're going to be providing coverage for the Mod Ball Rally, exclusive Mod Ball, exclusive Mod Ball Rally coverage for you coming forward in the next few days. Thanks a lot, guys. Catch you in the next video.